Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to, to this uh, webinar organized by Olea Medical. We have with us uh, Dr. Kambis Nahal, who's Professor of Radiology at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA in Los Angeles, United States. He will talk today about his uh, experience on the role of perfusion imaging in treatment to uh, follow up with brain tumors. Dr. Nahal, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anka. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Olia Medical for sponsoring this uh, session, this webinar, and I'm happy to uh, share uh, my experience uh, on use of perfusion imaging in uh, and treatment assessment of uh, patients with uh, brain tumors. So, um, essentially, the objectives of this uh, talk is um, to um, review the imaging findings of um, post-treatment changes in patients uh, with brain tumors and uh, to identify or to review how we can use advanced imaging, uh, specifically perfusion imaging, to differentiate post-treatment changes such as pseudoprogression or radiation necrosis from uh, true pro uh, progressive disease uh, that uh, you know, we identify with uh, different criteria such as McDonald criteria, Raynor criteria, or Resist criteria. And in order to do that, besides conventional imaging uh, for brain, which includes um, you know, T1, T2, flare, uh, post-contrast images, you know, we have a variety of uh, different uh, so-called advanced uh, imaging modalities or sequences and that includes uh, perfusion, uh, DSC perfusion, dynamic susceptibility contrast perfusion, uh, and permeability imaging, uh, ASL, arterial spin labeling, spectroscopy, and PET. And really, uh, during this talk, we are going to focus on the, the two uh, perfusion methodologies that I use in, in my practice, and that includes uh, DSC and DCE. Uh, um, so this is basically a, a diagram of our brain and tumor uh, uh, protocol using MRI. So first, we obtain some uh, conventional images including T1 pre-contrast, flare, gradient uh, images, diffusion images. And then uh, we uh, perform a dynamic contrast enhance or DCE or the so-called permeability perfusion imaging. Uh, that's basically a T1 uh, gradient sequence with temporal resolution in the order of five to six seconds. Then uh, we obtain our uh, T2 and uh, you know, DTI images, you know, if, if they've been ordered for treatment planning, for example, or for tractography. And then we with uh, dynamic uh, susceptibility contrast or DSC, which is an EPA gradient EPI sequence, uh, the temporal resolution in the order of 1.5 seconds. And uh, we basically use a split uh, dose of contrast. So the standard dose of contrast, we give basically the first 40% for DCE, and then uh, the rest of the contrast at the end for uh, our DSC uh, imaging. Uh, this table is just uh, to summarize um, um, the advantages and disadvantages of uh, each technique. And uh, um, basically we use uh, a complement complementary uh, uh, um, use them as complement to each other in our uh, imaging uh, and interpretation. And during this talk, I'll review how uh, exactly we do that. So DSC, uh, again, just to uh, reiterate, it's a T2 star rated technique. It measures vascular density. Uh, so one parameter that we use specifically for brain tumor imaging is several blood volume, CBV. Uh, advantages of DSC includes easy image uh, acquisition. It's relatively fast, uh, about 90 seconds uh, in the entire acquisition time. And it's brought uh, available post-processing is um, so appealing. Uh, disadvantages include lack of absolute quantification, uh, so it's relative. And uh, also uh, it is prone to susceptibility artifact as it is a T2 star rated technique. So if you have blood products or uh, you're close to the airborne born interface and it can cause um, some artifact. DCE, on the other hand, dynamic contrast enhance is a T1 rated technique. Uh, one of the parameters that it, 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 it is measured by this technique is K-trans, which is basically a measure of vascular permeability. Uh, and 
advantages of VCE includes uh, um, lack of, uh, you know, it's not prone to sustainability artifact as it is a T1 rated technique. And it provides a different uh, perspective of tumor angiogenesis by looking at the macro uh, vasculature. Uh, the disadvantages used to be complex uh, post processing as it requires pharmacokinetic model. But, but as uh, some of you know, if you're using OLEA, you know that this is uh, provided by OLEA within their uh, platform. And um, again, I'll show you some examples uh, throughout this uh, talk. So uh, the two concepts that we're going to talk about is pseudoprogression and uh, radiation necrosis and how we can differentiate them from uh, re uh, recurrent disease medicine before. Pseudoprogression is essentially a clinical diagnosis. It is an imaging finding. So what you see in pseudoprogression is uh, interval uh, uh, development of enhancing uh, tissue after treatment. Uh, the most common window is within the first 12 weeks uh, within the treatment window. Not always, uh, it can be slightly more delayed or slightly, uh, but, but that's the most common window within the first 12 weeks from the, uh, from the treatment. And it uh, usually regresses over the course of six to nine months uh, following the start of treatment. This is an example from literature, that's tissue basically biopsy proven pseudo uh, progression and you can see after treatment, you start developing this nodular enhancement. And as uh, time goes on, uh, it uh, basically decreases over time. And by, by one year from the treatment, basically, it uh, basically went back to uh, where it was. Uh, so this nodular component has regressed. And it was biopsy, and then the, the, the biopsy showed negative uh, results for recurrent uh, uh, disease. But as you can imagine, and this can be a very challenging uh, diagnosis. Uh, very interesting, this is a, a, a statement from a recent neuro-oncology uh, neuro paper that was published just a few months ago in 2020, that despite everything that we have right now, accurate and timely diagnosis of pseudoprogression remains one of the most important quandary of glioma management. So it is still very challenging and um, in terms of uh, um, patients, you know, reassuring patients uh, that this imaging finding that uh, you, uh, they have is basically post-treatment change, not recurrence. And also in terms of treatment uh, decision-making, whether to change treatment or uh, stick with the protocol that they already have, it has uh, clinical uh, and prognostic implications. Um, Advanced imaging may be helpful in my experience, uh, you know, in what we did over the last few years. Uh, one thing we found extremely helpful uh, is uh, so not necessarily the value, their absolute value, but how they change over time. And uh, specifically uh, looking at uh, several blood volume and K-trans before and after treatment uh, can be um, uh, helpful to differentiate pseudoprogression from a progressive disease. So this was a 38-year-old woman who uh, had a breast cancer. Uh, this was uh, resected in, in the cerebellum, in the posterior fossa. You can see that it was resected. Some nodular component uh, uh, remained after surgery that was treated with uh, radiation. Uh, um, so radiation treatment was applied. And post-radiation, You uh, this is the, the follow-up imaging. And a few months later, you can see that there is a heterogeneous and nodular enhancement along the resection cavity, obviously concerning for um, recurrence, but also uh, could potentially be pseudoprogression. So in order to make that diagnosis, um, as I said, uh, we found uh, looking at trend of imaging uh, biomarkers is helpful. Obviously, if you have the luxury of time, you wait a few more months, and then you see that this was indeed pseudoprogression. This was resolved after almost two months. Um, all these uh, enhance, uh, enhancing foci have been essentially resolved. But if you want to make that diagnosis at a time, uh, it would be helpful to have perfusion imaging again before and after uh, the SRS treatment, and then look at the interval change of uh, cellular bulk volume and K trans CR changing. In order to establish this uh, protocol for us, we actually did a, a, a research a study looking at uh, patients with brain metastasis in our practice uh, who were treated with uh, radiation treatment. Uh, 
and they must have uh, MRI before and after treatment, including perfusion imaging. Uh, and then we had a follow-up uh, MRI uh, in, in the range of 6 to 12, 14 months uh, from, uh, from the uh, beginning uh, of the start of treatment to uh, basically come up with a diagnosis of prog progressive disease or pseudoprogression. Uh, so we looked at 29 uh, patients and um, out of these 29 uh, um, patients that uh, they're uh, included, um, 22 patients had uh, pseudo uh, lesions, uh, had a diagnosis of pseudo progression, and uh, 10 patients had a diagnosis of uh, progressive uh, disease. And uh, when we uh, looked at the, uh, the trend of imaging biomarkers, uh, interestingly, 19 out of 22 patients with a diagnosis of pseudo progression, they showed interval decrease in cerebral volume. And um, in the progressive category, nine out of 10 uh, showed interval increase in K-trans and eight out of 10 showed interval increase in their RCVV. So based on this paper, uh, we basically concluded that if you see interval decrease in uh, cerebral blood volume, uh, uh, this, uh, that finding can point to a pseudo progression rather than progressive disease. And if the CVV is going up or K-trans is going up, then and, uh, you're probably uh, dealing with uh, progressive disease. Um, so in this case uh, that I showed you earlier, uh, uh, we basically generate, you know, usually this is how we do it in our practice, we generate a volume of interest over the enhancing component. And then we look at the, uh, the cerebral blood volume. Uh, uh, and then, you know, we do image registration using OVIA. And we look at the trend of imaging uh, biomarkers. And we can see in this patient, before treatment, the uh, cerebral volume was 2.8, then it decreased to 1.2 after radiation at this point, and K-trans was 0.05, it decreased basically to 0.02. So both of them are decreasing, uh, suggestive of uh, pseudoprogression, which was confirmed by imaging a couple of months uh, later. Uh, another patient, this was a patient with uh, high-grade glioma. Uh, you can see that this patient was biopsied. Uh, these are post uh, T1 post contrast images. This was a diffuse infiltrative glioma with multiple areas of enhancement in the corpus callosum on the other side. So it was not a resectable lesion. So this was treated with radiation tinozolamide. Three months later, you can see significant increase in enhancing component in the corpus callosum here and the single gyrus. And then it uh, basically there's more enhancing component a couple of months later. And these are flare images. And at this point, you basically need to know whether you're looking at a uh, post-treatment effect or, again, uh, time, you wait and you see that after a few more months, this basically region is uh, near completely resolved. There's some residual enhancement, but this was indeed all pseudoprogression. But you really like to make that diagnosis here in order to reassure the patient and also in order to um, uh, adjust your uh, treatment uh, planning. So we are going to look at uh, um, these um, uh, imaging sessions here. Uh, again, I have a, a several more volume from DSC and K-trans from DCE. Uh, and uh, we basically generate a volume of interest over the enhancing component. And you can see that, again, the CVV is decreasing over time. And the K-trans is, is dropping also over time, pointing to the fact that this is indeed a patient with uh, pseudoprogression, which was again confirmed by follow-up imaging a few months uh, later. So um, moving to the uh, radiation necrosis topic, um, it's uh, again, you know, it can be a diagnostic challenge. Uh, it's common, uh, up to 50% um, of patients, of treated patients with glioma, uh, they may have um, both um, a necr necrotic component in the treatment bed uh, in addition to some residual tumor. So uh, that makes it uh, even more challenging. But really, our job is to identify what is the dominant uh, component of, uh, of, of the tumoral bed, whether it's post-treatment changes and necrosis or uh, residual tumor. They're not, they're not uh, completely exclusive, so you may have, you always, almost always have um, uh, you know, component of each, 
but really our job is to find out what is the dominant component. In terms of uh, radiation necrosis, it uh, usually occurs uh, later than sewer progression, uh, within 6 to 12 months uh, from uh, the, the, in, the, initi the initiation of uh, treatment. And advanced imaging uh, plays a critical role. Uh, the role of advanced imaging in diagnosis of radiation necrosis is more established uh, uh, co in comparison to um, pseudo progression. So pseudo progression, as I uh, said, you know, in our experience, at least uh, the trend of imaging biomarker is helpful. But for radiation necrosis, there has been a significant amount of uh, uh, literature showing that advanced imaging can be helpful in order to differentiate the two. Uh, with uh, different uh, threshold methodologies that have been reported. I'm just going to share experience, our experience uh, uh, um, of how we do this, uh, basically, uh, image analysis. So this was a 54-year-old man uh, uh, with a, a glioblastoma that was uh, resected, so gross total resection, and then treated with tumor radiation. And you can see uh, that over time, uh, gradually developed uh, this uh, nodular enhancement along the resection cavity, and that basically increased a few more uh, months uh, uh, later. Uh, and um, again, when you have this enhancing component showing up, you like to make that diagnosis. So uh, uh, we are, you know, again, we're going to look at the several ball volume and K-trans, and uh, these are, you know, some numbers that we got from uh, this enhancing component. Uh, pointing uh, to the fact that this is uh, a predominantly a post-treatment um, change and radiation necrosis uh, or uh, the treatment-related necrosis as opposed to recurrent disease. So uh, before we talk about numbers, uh, again, I'd like to share uh, the, the research that we did for this uh, uh, for this analysis. So we included, uh, we basically looked at patients with glioblastoma who had gross solar resection and or treated with radiation and temozolomide, and then developed an enhancing mass after uh, completion of their treatment. We uh, looked at 46 patients, pathology proven. Uh, they have a basic a second biopsy of the enhancing uh, lesion, showing um, 34 of these lesions, they have evidence of recurrence. Uh, and 12 of these patients, they have post-treatment change or radiation necrosis as the predominant component in histopathology. And uh, we looked at uh, the uh, cerebral blood volume and K-trans uh, in the MRI before the second uh, uh, resection. And what we found uh, uh, was uh, the CBV uh, relative cerebral blood volume at threshold of uh, approximately 2.2, uh, had overall accuracy of uh, 85%. Uh, K-trans at threshold of 0.1 had a accuracy of 75%. The combined uh, CBV and K-trans together, uh, we basically increased the overall accuracy to 92.8%. Uh, this is the paper that this result uh, published in. So we basically use this uh, in our reading room. We have actually a chart of this. Uh, um, and this is how our fellows basically been uh, been uh, evaluating in these studies according to this chart. So if the RCBV is more than two, uh, if K-trans is more than 0.1, and if the um, the permeability curve that I show you uh, here uh, it has rapid arterial phase, then uh, we are looking at uh, a recurrent or progressive disease, and um, otherwise uh, we're probably looking at post-treatment changes or radiation necrosis. The permeability curve, as many of you may be aware of, is basically uh, we're looking at the CE perfusion uh, in dry region of interest or the enhancing component, and look at the the pattern of enhancement. If you have any of these two curves with uh, initial rapid arterial phase, uh, that is suggestive of having a viable uh, tumor as opposed to uh, radiation necrosis or necrotic uh, tissue that doesn't have this rapid arterial component and basically show some very slow uh, progressive enhancement over time. Uh, and again, this uh, can be quantified and all your medical actually uh, provide that and I'll show you example of this uh, in a couple of uh, next couple of cases that I'm going to share with you. This was a 59 year old man treated with GBM can see a large mass, uh, some motion at the, uh, the beginning at the, the, the baseline imaging. But this was uh, had, had gross total resection 
and this is follow-up imaging, a collapse of surgical cavity, some enhancement there, and then there is more enhancement along the resection margin, um, almost six months after the initial treatment. Uh, and uh, again, over time, uh, we see that there, you know, there is more enhancement, uh, there is some enlarged, you know, some progressive increase in size, and some enhancement. The question is whether this enhancement here is uh, necrosis or recurrent disease. So we are going to look at advanced imaging or perfusion imaging in that specific study. Uh, these are co-registered uh, maps of CBV, K-trans, and you can see by just looking at them, there is no really elevation of CBV within this lesion or K-trans. If we draw a region of interest uh, over this enhancing component, the RCBV uh, relative to contralateral side was 1.3, K-trans was 0 0.04, and you can see that uh, this um, um, pattern of enhancement is quantified, and these are the maps from OIA, showing that there is zero basically rapid uh, component. So there is no real rapid component, it just has slow uh, phase. So this lesion meets all the three criteria that we use in order to identify radiation necrosis. Again, this is uh, just for your reference. Uh, RCVV is less than 2, K-trans is less than 0.1, and it doesn't have rapid arterial phase, and therefore this is suggestive of uh, a post-treatment change or necrotic uh, component rather than recurrent disease. So contrast that to this case, 57-year-old woman, treat, again, a treated GPM. Uh, you can see that uh, th this was uh, the uh, post-op uh, images. I don't have the higher pop on the secondary resection cavity, but I just want to show you the, the, no the nodular enhancing component that developed over time. And again, uh, for, uh, you know, if you're looking at this study here, uh, almost uh, you know, nine months after the initial um, post-op imaging, you, know, you clearly see that there is evidence of progressive disease, but you like to make that diagnosis uh, sometimes here uh, earlier, so you can adjust your treatment planning. So let's look at the study that was done uh, um, almost six months before that final study. Uh, and again, you can see just by looking at these are uh, co-registered images, CBV, K-trans, you can see that there is elevation of K-trans, there is elevation of several bulk volume. And if you do quantitative analysis, the uh, RCBV is 3.5, K-trans is 0.4, and uh, again, there is a 59% uh, rapid uh, arterial component to this lesion. Uh, so this lesion meets uh, all three criteria for recurrent or progressive disease, CDV more than 2, uh, or RCDV more than 2, K-trans more than 0.1, and has rapid arterial uh, component. So this was indeed a um, um, patient with uh, progressive disease or recurrent disease. So in summary, uh, treatment response assessment uh, is including uh, zoo progression and radiation necrosis uh, versus recurrence. This is definitely a diagnostic challenge on conventional imaging alone, and advanced imaging can play um, a significant uh, role. Uh, again, uh, zoo progression is more uh, challenging, and uh, we need to be humble about uh, that uh, in, in our ability to to uh, confidently diagnose pseudoprogression. What works for us right now is really the interval change in RCBV and K-trans. So if we have perfusion imaging before and after treatment, there is trend, a downward trend of uh, several blood volume and K-trans that uh, points to uh, diagnose pseudoprogression. Uh, for radiation necrosis, as I said, there is more established li uh, literature uh, and uh, different thresholds depending on what it works for your practice. But these numbers, so what we have established in our practice, if the CBV is elevated, uh, we use a threshold more than two. That's com compared to contralateral side. The K trans is elevated, that is absolute, uh, uh, absolute quantification, it's more than 0.1. And if you have rapid arterial phase, then uh, you're basically uh, looking at a recurrent disease or progressive disease as opposed to uh, post treatment change or radiation necrosis. And with that, I uh, thank you very much for your attention and happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Niall. Uh, we have some questions already. So, um, first of all, could you explain the physiological processes behind radiation necrosis and pseudoprogression? Yes. What's so, the 
between the two, actually. Yeah, so you know the the uh, the, dif the differences uh, the the, hist the histopath you know if you look at the histopathology uh, literature, um, this this pseudo progression basically uh, there you know there is there is evidence of more inflammatory changes uh, in the uh, pseudo progression so it's kind of a more acute phase uh, of post treatment changes, uh, um, but if you look at radiation necrosis. You basically have uh, you know, hyaluronized uh, vessels, uh, uh, have fibrotic tissue, you have infiltration of uh, fibroblasts uh, and macrophages. So it's like more, more, uh, more chronic changes. I mean, I don't have the exact uh, detail in terms of histopathology, but I think what makes uh, pseudo progression uh, more challenging uh, in terms of our ability to identify by imaging is that it uh, the presence of acute inflammatory uh, markers and inflammatory phase uh, uh, that uh, can uh, sometimes have, um, can result in elevation of um, uh, several blood volume, for example, uh, or perfusion imaging. Uh, so and that's why I think the trend is more helpful compared to what uh, you see in radiation necrosis that is more chronic stage of, uh, of inflammation with no uh, acute uh, component. Uh, thank you very much. The second question is, what's the role of, uh, if there is any, of a blood flow maps in, uh, in the treatment follow-up of brain tumors? Uh, so blood flow, uh, I'm assuming uh, uh, this, uh, the CBF, uh, the question yeah. is referring to CBF. Yeah, you know, I, uh, I per personally, I don't know. I haven't, uh, you know, we haven't really looked at uh, CBF. You know, we did we did a uh, study a couple of years ago looking at ASL, uh, CBF, uh, um, in order to you know look at post treatment changes. Uh, we didn't really find a significant difference, uh, and uh, again that was a limited and small study. I know there are there is you know there are a couple of papers or, or a few papers published on on, uh, on using of use of ASL and specifically use of cerebral blood flow to differentiate the two, but. Um, I think you know the 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 arterial transient delay uh, sometimes can be challenging uh, in these in these patients. Um, um, so I don't know. I know in terms of DSC CBF, I I don't have any experience of uh, on, on using uh, CBF to differentiate the two processes from each other. We really looked at CBV. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, another question, is there any rational, I believe it is, but I'd like you to explain it. Is there any rational to performing DC prior to DSC in terms of contrast agent and, uh, and results? So the, if, if you are going to do both, you have to do DCE first uh, because it's a T1-beta technique and you know, if you have contrast on board, then you can't really do DC because you need to have a non-contrast uh, you know, phase uh, and then you give contrast and then you look at the T1 uh, change between the baseline and what is effect of, of, of contrast injection. So if you are going to do DCE, DCE needs to be done first. And then the other rationale uh, uh, for us to do DCE first is basically we use that contrast bolus that we uh, uh, use for DCE as a a, a kind of a preload uh, for uh, for um, leakage correction in our DCE in our DSC imaging. Uh, so it actually serves two purposes. We we basically get the DCE that we want uh, as you know we use it as a complement uh, in some of the cases that DSC may be challenging, for example, for artifact or for whatever reason. Uh, and then the second purpose is actually that contrast that we give serves as a preload for leakage correction for uh, DSC analysis. Thank you. A last question is uh, how uh, standardized among models are those uh, cutoff values for RCBV and K-trans? How reproducible yeah. are they among various post-processing solutions? Yeah, so so the, you know that's that's a very good question, and I think that's that's really where where the challenge is. You know, if you look at 
Yeah, the literature, uh, you know, again, for like use of DESC, for example, and uh, CBV uh, specifically, to differentiate the two, there are diff there, you know, there are different uh, variety of thresholds uh, between institutions and between diff uh, different softwares. But um, so the, I don't think they're standardized. This is again what we use in our practice. We establish these thresholds based on an internal study that I'll show you the result and we publish it and, you know, this is what we do. But again, you know, if you look at the literature, you know, the, the CBV ranging from 1.7 to 2.2, for example, it's uh, where most of the literature is pointing to uh, show, you know, showing that that cutoff, you know, anywhere between 1.7 to 2.2, 2 .2, I think I've seen a lot of papers in that range. So that threshold is, you know, there, there may be a range and, you know, you definitely be playing with the statistics. So, you know, if you use a higher threshold, you're probably going to be more specific, maybe, and less sensitive. If you use lower threshold, you're going to be more sensitive, less specific. It's really, you have to find what works for you in, in, in the institution in, based on your, the data you have and based on the software you use. Uh, so I don't think this is standardized. I wouldn't take those numbers and then use them in my practice, you know, if I'm practicing, uh, you know, somewhere else. Uh, you have to really do your due diligence and uh, do some internal study to see what works for you. Thank you. There are finally two more questions. So, uh, first of all, to quantify CBV and K-trans parameters, how do you choose region of interest or volume of interest placement in the case of glioblastoma? regarding enhanced necrotic and edema components? So we, uh, we analyze the data only within the enhancing tissue. Uh, so we basically generate a volume of interest uh, over the enhancing component. We use T1 post contrast images and, and a volume of interest is, is drawn over the enhancing component. Uh, that is done by our fellows or the faculty. Um, and the same for K-trans. So everything that I told you, they're, they're only we don't we don't really draw ROI over the flare um, in like uh, hyper intense non enhancing component. Uh, this is everything I show you is based on enhancing tumor or enhancing tissue. Thank you very much. And finally, how prevalent are pseudo progression and radio necrosis in the past treatment phase? Um. You know, I don't have a number, but I, I tell you, you know, in, in, in the uh, in the metastasis group that I showed you, um, it's relatively common. Uh, a lot of these patients, you know, they get initially they get, um, in, you know, increase in, in the size of tumor and uh, you know, the enhancing component increases. And then basically after a few months, you see that there's the interval decrease. So I think in it's more pseudo progression is the as this, you know, at least in our experience. And with the immunotherapy now, um, we actually see uh, a lot more pseudo progression uh, in patients with uh, glioma. Um, I think that, you know, the literature, you know, the, there is a range between 20 to 30%, uh, but in the e immunotherapy, I think that, 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 that number is definitely higher. Uh, again, we haven't looked at our immunotherapy data yet, but I, with the immunotherapy that is, you know, is commonly used these days for treatment of glioma, I would expect to see a lot more pseudo progression uh, in our practices. Thank you very much. There is no additional question. And, uh, oh, sorry, there is a, a last one. Okay. Are there other parameters to look for to combine with perfusion parameters to detect early progression? Um, yeah, so I mean, I, you know, I, I think as, as I showed in the initial slide, there are different, you know, a variety of, of, of imaging that we have. You know, I know some places they use ASL, uh, spectroscopy. You know, there's, there's some institution that they still like a spectroscopy and they use that. And then PET, uh, so you know, the physiological imaging, you know, doing PET, uh, amino acid PET, I think, you know, there are 
Yeah, we actually use it here also at UCLA, uh, uh, you know, uh, PET for problem solving. But I think there are other other uh, sequences and other imaging modalities that can help. Um, what I show you is basically uh, was our uh, experience using two perfusion, you know, DSC, DCE combined together. And that is basically our, our bread and butter uh, brain tumor perk that everyone gets these. But, you know, there are some some cases, specific cases that we may add uh, uh, spectroscopy. Um, then there are some cases that we, we ask basically for PET to resolve uh, the, the, you know, the problem that we have. But this is the bread and butter uh, protocol that I, I discuss uh, that we use in our practice. Well, now we are, there are no more questions. Thank you very much. Thanks all of you, all of those who, who interacted for the question sec session and thank you very much dr nav for her presentation yeah no thank you and thank you everyone and have a safe uh holiday you too okay bye-bye bye-bye